Washington. Yeah, I'm Malcolm McPhail, uh, my wife Ardell. We bought this farm in 1982, uh, so we've been farming a while. We have three employees that, uh, Allison being uh, one, uh, she's worked for us nine years. We have uh, uh, Blaine 31 years and Juan 20 years, and uh, that's the only way we can farm with people who are, I couldn't farm without them. Allison. My name's uh, Allison Hilson. I worked for McPhail's, as he said, for the past nine years. I'm uh, Kim Patton, retired extension professor uh, working down in southwest Washington. Been working on cranberries for 30 years. Malcolm, uh, tell us a little bit about your farm. How many acres of cranberries are you responsible for? Okay, we, we, uh, we started in 1981. We bought the neighboring farm and there was only three acres that we could harvest. Now we have a hundred acres. Uh, there are 62 contiguous acres at, uh, on this property. Then we have 32 over at a, a different location and then six in another location. My son has 22 acres. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's been uh, purchasing additional properties planting new properties, we renovate, we renovate something every year, which is very expensive. Uh, you can see the excavator over here that uh, we're, uh, I'm scalping now for a 2.6 acre bog that uh, I was going to buy uh, vines from uh, <coughs> Bob Donaldson down in, in Bandon, Oregon, some Welkers, which are uh, from uh, Rutgers University. But then he had scale. He called me and said I, he couldn't do it. And it was $6 a pound, so I would have spent $42,000 for, for vines and then uh, for that 2.6 acres that uh, we're getting vines from uh, Wisconsin this year. Kim, can you rattle off the major insect, weed, and disease pests of cranberries? Uh, the insects we have, fireworm is probably the major one uh, that can be very decimating. Uh, it's relatively easy to control, but the timing is always difficult, and there's always some sections of some farms that get uh, damaged by it. It's Lepidoptera. There's another uh, lep, uh, cranberry girdler, also called sod webworm, which is rather difficult to control. We really don't have anything to control it. Um, there are, it's a black vine weevil is a major pest and that's been problematic. Uh, it's, we've got some chemistries that work on it, but it's, it's still a problem. Uh, those are our major three now and then recently, last uh, half a dozen years, we've got tipworm that's coming in. It's a midge that's been pretty devastating and uh, managing to get a handle on that with some new chemistries. Those are your, your insects, the, the diseases. Mostly we have uh, fruit rot issues. Uh, there's uh, about five or six major fruit rotting organisms that all kind of come in together and uh, rot fruit off. Uh, there are some uh, foliage diseases, twig blight, lophodermium, which if you don't, if you have it and you don't spray, uh, your farm's gone. It's just over, over one year, there's, it's gone. And so it really is problematic if you're an organic farmer, there's no really way to control that. Um, those are your, your major diseases. There are a few other ones, but those are minor. And, six, and then weeds, uh, we have, uh, it's sort of the, the bane of farming cranberries are weeds, and because you really can't get in here and cultivate, so essentially a lot of the low-growing weeds, they're really hard to get to. The, the lotus corniculatuses, like the lotus uh, versus trefoil, a lot of the sedges and the rushes are all really problematic. Uh, some of the grasses, uh, on and on and on. Um, horsetail. Horsetail, Ecclesetum is a really pain and, and sort of the only, because you're growing in these wetlands, so all these sort of wetland weeds are, you tend to be growing in wetlands, uh, wetland weeds like horsetail, really hard to control. And the only thing that works is casserole. If you get, lay off your casserole, uh, horsetail will come in and take over your farm uh, and it's sort of you can't farm without casserole. It's, so there's quite a lot of pests. Uh, it's really hard uh, to do these organically uh, successfully in the state of Washington. There are some exceptions in other air growing areas but not in Washington. When we talk to the 
raspberry growers, there's almost no organic raspberries in Washington. We talked to the blueberry growers and there's a lot of organic uh, blueberries. Um, what percent of the Washington cranberry industry is organic? Uh, zero. And, and there have been little spits and spurts of some industry starts and some enterprising people are ambitious and had some nice, nice uh, organic farm up the road and it went out of bankrupt. Uh, few years ago. There's some success down in Oregon. They have a little better environment there and they can start wheat free but you go into an area that's been growing cranberries for a hundred years and it's just the pest pressure is too great. There's just not adequate organic controls for the weeds. Weeds and in particular, weeds. yeah. And some of the insects and some of the, well basically all of them. <laughs> you know it's really hard and the profit level you can get, uh, they can grow cranberries in Quebec uh, near the Arctic Circle uh, cheaper and better uh, organically than we can grow them conventionally. So you can't compete. And so from the, the cranberries, the organic cranberries in Quebec, there's 10,000 acres or something like that, or 5,000 acres. And it just, it's just not profitable. You can't compete. You said that you apply the insecticides at night. Why, why do you do that? To, so we don't kill any of the, the bumblebees or birds or anything out there. That uh, So that <clears throat> when we have uh, 13 pumps, so that by the time we get around, we have to do it over two nights, and she's doing half of them and I'm doing half of them. And uh, the, uh, anyway, that's, uh, we can do, we can do fungicides in, uh, in the daytime. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Patton, can you <clears throat> talk about how the cranberry industry got access to these products? Uh, it's a long-term project and just as an example, I think this proven here, I first started working on it in 94. So that's 26 years it took to get this thing registered uh, for use. Uh, on cranberries? On cranberries, yes. And it had a different name. It, well, it was under the main manufacturer of uh, Matrix. DuPont. Matrix. And, yeah, Matrix. And Matrix. they were not interested in it. It was a great product. It finally had to go off label and so forth. But between doing the initial research, the IR4 projects to get the residue data, getting, and then all the other information that you need and getting the companies on board, it takes a long time. So you're looking at five, ten, Pro nothing is as short as five years. Uh, ten maybe would be the shortest years to get any of these projects registered. Some of them aren't here, even though they're registered, because they're MRL issues. What's an MRL? Uh, minimum residue levels so that they're perfectly legal in the United States, but they're above the tolerance level accepted in the EU. So, for example, uh, one of our herbicides, uh, Quinstar, Quinclorac, uh, it's a great herbicide. It's an amazing product. We can't. We can use it, but only for stuff sold in the United States. But that makes it really messy in terms of handling all the fruit and everything like that. So growers, that costs us three dollars. Yeah, three dollars. We an use acre. it. It can only be used domestically, and so they they knock off three dollars of our price. Your price of the cranberries. And three dollars so, a barrel, right? And three dollars so a barrel. A barrel, yeah. not an acre. And so. it's for two years, so that's. Uh, so there, there, it's a, and some of these, uh, for example, uh, Canada had Movento. A lot of these, we all work together from across Canada and the United States. You get your four states plus a site, and usually in Canada, where you do the research for the IR4 uh, and to get the residue levels uh, funded. A lot of it is funded through the Pesticide Commission and the, uh, and the Cranberry Commission and other, you know, pull together the monies. There's another research, the Cranberry Institute, that helps fund some of these projects. Uh, all the research is done across the state, so you get all your residue data uh, across all these areas. Uh, and even then, uh, for example, Movento, Canada had it registered three years before we could use it in the U.S. Uh, some of these uh, get registered, they don't have a chemigation label on them, so uh, if you, you really can't use them. Uh, because we put everything out through chemigation. There's always little problems with every product that just takes forever. Some of them, like Callista, was a great project, a great product, uh, but we had to go through an emergency registration, uh, Section 18, for the first three years, I believe. Uh, 
And well, Wash Washington State was the first one that yeah. used Callisto because of Kim. So it just to get it, it's it's the it's quite a dance to get any product registered on a minor crop, and where you're working with lots of partners, and uh, usually you end up uh, a lot of them just don't go anywhere too. And some of the best products we would love to have are not available. Or just they just don't want to register on a minor crop where there's only 30,000 acres, 35,000 acres in the U.S. The risk of growing in aquatic uh, sort of areas is too much for these major pesticide companies to even consider using, uh, and so it's why bother come with the liability issues. So you kind of wait. Some of them come off um, label or off. Um, off patent. Off patent, and then you can get some places like New Farm would register on cranberries and so forth. Um, one all advantage, great products. One advantage with Movento, the fact that the Canadians use it in British Columbia, they knew how to use it so that we could talk to some of our better growers in Canada. And yeah, the industry is so small that, that we communicate. We know people from everywhere in uh, as far as what, the five states, the five principal states. Uh, you can ask questions about how, uh, like I call New Jersey, where they have a lot of disease problems about some of our products and whether you can use it uh, close to, uh, you know, what timing and that sort of thing. And one of the, I think the other key point to, to mention is that we are losing more registrations that we're getting. So a lot of the traditional chemistries, uh, the OPs and so forth, and some of the herbicides are, are, are no longer available. So these are really good substitutes and without them we wouldn't be able to farm.